Okay, now if if I was going out to if I see a car I like and I say see it then it's a uh, now would you recommend buying from a, a car dealer or buying from? Uh, well, most people like buying from an individual because right. buying from an individual they feel like uh, they're going to get a, a more honest deal. Now there's one thing people have to watch for it. It's got a name now. It's called curbsiding. There are a lot of people out there that are selling used cars, adding them in papers, and they're pretending it's their car or their brother-in-law's car, right. and they're salesmen, really. Right. Uh, you want to check that out by always looking at the title of a car before any deals. And if, if, if you're at all suspicious, say you want to see the title. If they say, well, they don't have it, then go on to somebody else because yeah. there's a lot of people doing that. Yeah, well, we we got a guy down the, down the street here on Henry that uh, every week I go by there, he has a new car in front of his house. <laughs> yeah, now, if they're honest about it, it doesn't matter. If, yeah. if they have a used car dealer license, they can show it to you, and they'll say, yes, I'm a used car dealer, and I buy and sell. Some of those guys, they know what they're doing. They'll buy a car for 1000 sell it for 2000 mm -hmm. and if somebody gets a good car for 2000 they could be very happy with it, but a lot of these people are just guys that go out and they buy wrecked cars yeah. or cars that have been stolen. They pick them up for for five, six hundred dollars, fix them as cheaply as they can, and try to sell them for three or four thousand dollars. The general way to find those people are in the ads in the paper. The asking price will usually always be a few thousand or fifteen hundred less than what the book value of the car is in those blue books, and that's pretty much a flag that says, oh, these people may be the salesman selling and pretending it's somebody else. Right. Now, most people will advertise a car at book value, which is usually highly inflated in what it's actually worth, but they advertise it at book, so when you barter with them, you can come down. These guys already come down because they don't want to waste their time. They want to get people fast to sell cars and then sell another one, and they're, they're, they're pretty sharp at it, so you always want to look at the title, see whose name is it. Okay. So you should well, check, the, check the name of the title and check, look check. the name, see if it's their name. And, uh, See how old then, the title is. Uh, of course, the biggest thing there is it'll always tell you the last owner of the car and the original owner. If they're not the original, it goes back two generations. And if uh, they say it's one owner and it's got somebody else's name on as the previous lien holder, you know, they're <laughs> giving you a line of baloney. Okay. And that makes a lot in a used car because if it's a one owner, it's worth a lot more than if it's been through two or three people. Okay, now if you're going up to these, these people and they're selling this, this used car, now, aren't they selling it for re the reason that, uh, okay, there's too many things that are going wrong with this car, so they Well, there's buy lots of reasons. A lot of people are worried that when they get a used car, they're buying somebody else's problem. Yeah. Now, some of the times that's the case, but that's why I wrote this book. Today, it's not as much as it used to be because with the price of new cars averaging over $20,000, a lot of people can't afford a new car, and a lot of people, when they need cash, you just think, the only way you can get ready cash is by selling a car if you've got a nice car. It might take you a year to sell a house, and you know how TVs, VCRs are. You buy them for $800. If you ever try to sell them or pawn them, you're going to get about $50. Right, so right. Cars are worth a lot of money. And uh, As an example, last year I had a customer. She had three cars. Her and her two sons had three cars, and they needed money for college education. So what they did was they sold the best car they had because they knew they wouldn't get much for the two clunker. Right. But they sold a really nice Honda for four thousand dollars and the person who bought it happened to be one of my customers and she was real happy with the car and they were happy to get the money so there's plenty of good used cars out there you just have to know what you're doing by reading a book like mine and uh, uh you don't have to be a mechanic you just have to be able to read the english language <laughs> okay okay so uh, now the like you say the first first step is checking the the the, the, the title to see if it's a uh, yeah to see if it's a legitimate deal because you don't want to go any further if it's not a legitimate deal okay uh, and if it isn't just walk away now when an average person is checking out a car, there's three main things you want to look at, and that's the body, the engine, and the transmission. Everybody can use their eyes, look for blemishes, see if the paint doesn't match. And where you guys are, look under the wheel wells for rust, around all the windows, especially the front back windows, for rust, and open the trunk. Look under the spare tire and look around for rust there, because cars, that's where they start to rust. And when a car starts rusting, you guys know it's on its last legs, and you don't want to pay much money for a rusty car. You get in the car for a few hundred bucks, hey, you're going to get some rust up there. Down here in Texas, you don't, but up there you do, and it might still be a decent car, but you're paying a lot of money. You don't want to rust most of it. And then you want to check the transmission, which most cars are going to be automatic, back up for about a minute or two in an empty parking lot, because reverse is often the first gear that goes out in automatic. Okay. So back up a little, then go up and down hills and corners, see if it shifts right. Even if you don't know what a transmission is, you know when it doesn't shift right and it jerks and clunks or if it makes noises, then check the engine. And if you know how much your engine is, just start the car up, look for smoke. If you see black smoke or blue smoke, walk away. And when you're road testing it, uh, in the summer especially, if it has air conditioning, turn the air conditioning on full blast. And when you drive it 10, 15 minutes, hey, look at the temperature gauge. Because if the temperature
temperature gauge is getting too hot, walk away. Never buy a used car that has an overheating problem because maybe it's a $50 water pump, but hey, it might be a $2,000 engine job, and you don't want to mess with a car that's overheating if you're going to pay a decent dollar for it. Okay, okay. Some good tips in here. I mean, uh, this, this is oh, I've got millions of them in the book. <laughs> okay, all right. So this is something that I, I, I definitely should buy. I, I think yeah, I'm, it's, it's, I think because it, it's been a very expensive, <laughs> very very expensive lesson for me. I've, I've I've spent so many so much money on used cars. I mean, uh, a friend of mine over at the air show this week, we were joking about some car that uh, Robosaurus was going to eat because uh, it looked like a better car than some of the cars that I've had in the past. You know. So um, I, I was never a very good judge, a, a very good yeah, judge you know, this cars. book's only $12.95, and it's, I figure I've saved Americans about $50 million bucks by how many I've sold so far. I figure the average person is going to save about $500. And uh, it's knowledge that anybody can use. And even, even you, when you said, oh, I've lost a lot of money. Well, you haven't really. Because just think, if you would have bought new cars instead of used, if you bought one for 20 and then when it's seven, eight years old, it's worth about three. You just lost seventeen thousand right. dollars. And I imagine for seventeen thousand dollars, you could get quite a few good used cars. And even if a couple were lemons, you're still coming out ahead of time. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. I mean, the cars are cars are the worst investment Americans make because it's complete depreciation. And I don't even care if you go out and buy classic cars. I used to work with a guy that uh, he did classic cars. He'd buy them and fix them up and sell them. And they depreciate like anything else. Oh, yeah. Even though one of these books will say, uh, you know, 1956 Bugatti is worth $500,000. You try to find somebody who's going to pay you $500,000. Yeah. I've had customers all day long buy classic T-Birds and Lincolns and things like that from the 60s. And they were really six nice. And they picked the things up for seven, dollars $8,000. They never have all that much resale value because... It's a toy, and not that many people are going to spend fifteen, twenty grand. And for it's a very toy. expensive to keep it up. Yeah, yeah that they I, can't use every day anyway. I had a '62 Ford Fairlane that I finally sold because I, I found out how much money it was going to going to keep costing me to keep fixing this thing up, and I figured it was time to <laughs> it was time to get out. So. Yeah, when they get that old, they become toys. I have customers who bought a '60 uh, Studebaker with a V8 in it, and it really goes. Uh, but the thing is, every time it breaks, you might be laid up for a month or two trying to find parts. <laughs> Yeah. Now, as far as getting the book, is it, is it available in bookstores? You can order it in any bookstore in the United States, but if you're in a hurry, you can call 1-800-221-9697, and it's only $12.95. It'll save you a lot of headaches. <laughs> okay. So 1-800-221-9697. Okay. Or you can order it in any bookstore in the United States. Okay, we got a brand new Barnes & Noble. It's uh, just opened up today. So. Oh, uh, yeah, you can order it there. Just tell my name, Scott Kilmer, just like Val Kilmer. Same last name. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Scott. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should do a uh, a car tip of the week or something because uh, this, is, uh, I, this is definitely something that I could use. So maybe somebody else out there could uh, use it too. Sure. Anytime. Give me a call. Okay. Thanks, okay. Scott. Okay. Mm-hmm, bye. Goodbye. Robert R. Reeves, right? Right. Uh huh. Okay. Good morning, sir. Yes. Hi. How are you? And uh, you've got you've got a book out now too. Also, I didn't know this 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 uh, article that I that I was reading here about uh, James Dean. Uh, bedeviled car here it was uh, it was in the Fate magazine, but I guess you have a book out now. Now is the book out on James Dean, or is it on the car? What, what what exactly is the book about? Right, the article you were talking about was in Fate magazine, and then the book I have out is called James Dean Beyond the Grave, and uh, it kind of concerns the paranormal side of James Dean or the supernatural or psychic side. It's not always been uh, delved into. Okay, what's what's this what's this big fascination with James Dean? Do you think? Well. As you know, uh, it continues. Uh, he died 41 years ago last week, and last week they uh, reissued his movie Giant that was made 40 years ago. It was his last movie, and they reissued that to movie theaters uh, last week uh, to play in major cities in, in normal, regular theaters. So it, it's very unusual that somebody uh, continues to have this influence 40 years after their death. You know, the movies are still in theaters. They're on the current postage stamp. And... Um, the only people like that that I can think of would be maybe Marilyn Monroe or Elvis Presley. Uh-huh. And it's strange, you know, they all came from the 1950s, and yet somehow they're all uh, current and timely and topical, and people continue to identify with the image and symbol that they put out, and there continues to be this fascination for him. Okay, okay. I remember reading, reading things about that, the, the movie Giant, too. I remember, um, of course, the Rock Hudson was in it, and I thought that was one of the worst 
acting jobs Rock Hudson ever did. But, uh, well, and that was Oscar nominated <laughs> I know. for that as well as Jimmy Dean. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> and I also heard that James Dean, um, when he was in that movie, uh, during the, t- the scene where he was uh, um, loaded, that they had to redub his voice again because uh, they couldn't understand a word he said. So That's correct. Uh, he had just he had it written into his contract that he was not to race his uh, Porsche Spider, which is the car he would die in. Uh, he could not race that car until Giant wrapped up shooting. And as soon as Jimmy finished his very last scene in the movie, he took off for the races and he did die in this car accident on September 30th, 1955. Uh, his portion of Giant was finished, but they still had a week or two for some of the other actors uh, to work on the film. And in the last scene where he's supposed to be in an alcoholic stupor, uh, he mumbled some of his dialogue so badly that they did bring Nick Adams on uh, to go ahead and, and re-loop or redub Jimmy Dean's final words on the screen so they're, uh, you know, understandable. Okay. All right. All right. So I, I remember reading about that a long time. Anyway, um one qu- one thing that uh, we were, when we were talking on the phone a few days back about this uh, James Dean car thing before we get into the car part of it, now I never realized there was somebody else in the in the vehicle with James Dean. Right, uh, a lot of people are not aware of that he um, he had a, a Porsche mechanic by the name of Rolf Wetherich, and uh, he was a German fellow that had been a Luftwaffe pilot during World War II, and then he went to work for the Porsche factory, and he was uh, in California working at Competition Motors, which is where Jimmy Dean bought the Porsche in 1955 out in Los Angeles. And um, Dean insisted when he bought the car, it was $7,000 back then, which in 1955, that was a lot of money for a sport car. Uh And uh, in fact, there were only 90 of these cars ever made back there in the uh, mid-50s. And Jimmy specified when he bought the car that this guy, uh, Rolf Wetherich, who was a, a real good mechanic, that that guy would accompany him to uh, any of the races and see that the car was kept perfectly tuned up. So when Jimmy was driving the car that day, this guy was in the car with him. And uh, Jimmy died in the wreck, but this guy was thrown clear and was uh, you know, beat up pretty badly, and he was in the hospital for a year. But he did survive the wreck, but then went on to have a tragic life. Okay, can you, can you fill us in a little bit about this guy's life? I mean, that was yeah, affected? Uh, after, after the wreck, he was in a hospital for a year, and uh, he tried to uh, first sue James Dean estate, and then he ended up suing the other driver of that other car's estate to uh, collect some money to try to help him with his hospital bills, and uh, he ended up going back to Germany in the 1960s and working for the Porsche factory, but it was kind of like what people say about Muhammad Ali, if you get hit in the head too many times, are there some problems, and it was like uh, Rolf Wutherich had been involved in several car wrecks, and they wondered if this did something to his brain, because uh, he got pretty wild in the way he uh, carried on, and he was in a lot of bar brawls, and he became an alcoholic, and he was quite a womanizer. And when he did get married, uh, in 1968, he stabbed his wife to death. He killed her, and they uh, called it insanity, so he was put in an institution. And then after a while, he was let out, but uh, he continued having problems holding down a job and being stable. And by 1981, Rolf himself would die in a car accident back in his own hometown in Germany on a wet night driving a Honda. You know, he ended up by himself sliding off the road and crashing into a house and dying in 1981 in a car wreck. Doesn't die in a Porsche, but he dies in a Honda? Can you believe it? What can I say? <laughs> okay. All right. Now, getting to the car. Now, I, the car wasn't totally wrecked, I take it, so they uh, they actually, what, cut up pieces of the car and sold them at an auction or something? Or what? How did this... Yeah, the way it all started, uh, once, once this wreck took place... You know, it tore up the car fairly badly, but it was mainly the front end around the fender area, and it pushed the engine back, and uh, there were still a lot of good parts left on the car. And so, uh, like I said, it was a $7,000 car, and uh, it was purchased for $2,500, the wreckage. And the guy that purchased it out there in Los Angeles was the name of uh, George Barris. And uh, most people are familiar with Barris because he's the guy that is the famous king of the car customizers. He still shows up at car shows all over the country. And he's the guy that built the original Batmobile. Okay. He built the Munster Mobile, uh, the kit car from the Knight Rider series. You know, when it comes to anything that somebody needs in the way of a special car, George Barris usually has uh, has done the work on it for the last 40 years. And so, uh, anyway, so he went ahead and purchased the car for $2,500, and uh, he started parting it out. And the first thing he did was uh, sell the engine of the car to a guy named uh, Dr. Troy McHenry 
was an L.A. physician, and his hobby was car racing. And then he sold the drivetrain, the uh, transmission drive, the transaxle, sold that to another doctor. Both of these doctors put the car parts in their cars, and they were both in the same race at the Pomona Fairground in 1956, a year after Jimmy's death. And both of them ended up in car wrecks that day. One doctor was killed. The doctor that had the engine in the car was killed. And the doctor that had the transmission in the car was badly hurt. Hurt. And uh, so it's strange. And that's where it started from there. And it seemed like kind of like, you know, where Mary and her little lamb, wherever the lamb went, trouble followed. And it seemed to happen like this with the car as far as parting it out was concerned. He, uh, he went ahead. George Barris uh, sold the, the tires off of the Spider. And, of course, uh, within a week, the uh, tires both blew out, and this caused the driver to be run off the road. And at this time, Barris decided that it was best to quit parting the car out because, for whatever reason, it just seemed like everything went wrong. So instead, he just decided to put it in storage. But he was asked to take it out of storage uh, by the uh, California Highway Patrol because they were thinking that maybe this would be an interesting uh, traveling highway safety exhibit, you know, Oh, okay. Talk James Dean, and you know this could happen to you if you don't wear your safety belt and if you're careless or speeding or whatever. So they decided that they would use this then as a traveling exhibit. But the uh, the curse continued, and strange things, you know, kept happening. <laughs> the curse continued Wait, when they when they were transporting the car, things would happen, or what? Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Part of the time, like uh, one time, it was uh, in storage in uh, Fresno, and uh, a fire broke out that burned down the whole building and it destroyed every car that was in the building except for the Porsche. Of course. And it was slightly scorched. And uh, then, like I said, he uh, crates this, this car up and starts sending it out, and there was a fellow named George Berkowitz that was an employee of the state of California. He was hauling this death car on his flatbed truck, and he lost control of the vehicle, and he was thrown from the cab, but he was killed when this wreckage tore loose from its mooring, and it pinned him down beneath its weight. Hmm. Huh. Now th this car, uh, now it's, it's been misplaced, or, or I, I guess there's, there's still what the uh, the transaxle is still available, and uh, and people can, can I guess can still purchase this, but the car itself was it misplaced, or what happened to the car exactly? Yeah, uh, well after this one guy was killed, uh, you know the the car they started touring it about 1956, mm -hmm. and uh, for a while not too much happened in 57 and 58, and then in uh, 59 the car slipped off the truck and it broke into two pieces on the highway and that caused a wreck and uh, then by 1959 in New Orleans uh, the thing that had been welded together fell apart into 11 pieces hmm. and they put this thing back together again finally uh, the way it wound up uh, in Florida in Miami they had asked to uh, again do this uh, safety exhibit situation and uh, they did their act down there in Florida and then they went ahead and crated the car up and they sent it by freight to send it back to George Barris out in Los Angeles. And a week had passed, and the car had not arrived. And so, uh, you know, Barris thought the car was on its way, but it didn't show up. And so he checked into it, and he even hired a private investigator from Pinkerton's to check and see what happened. So finally, the, uh, the freight car does arrive late in Los Angeles. And then when they uh, unseal it and open up the door and open up the crate, there's no car. Hmm. So by 1960, the car had vanished. And uh, it has not been seen since. So, of course, the speculation is, you know, was the car stolen? Uh, was it simply misplaced by somebody? Does it still exist? You know, there, all those questions are still around. Or is the person who stole it uh, still alive? Yeah, Again, too. yeah, exactly, because yeah. that's been 36 years. Yeah. And I can't help but wonder, like the end of the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, did it end up just falling into the wrong hands? Uh, to somebody that didn't know anything about it, in a box someplace, just pushed to the back of a warehouse and maybe finally just uh, scrapped. You know, you, you wonder uh, how something like that does turn out. And it's hard to tell. It has been 36 years. Hmm. So, but, but there's still, uh, uh, the transaxle is still available. So that's the only thing left of the car. That's the only car. part, yeah. That the uh, transaxle, which had, you know, one of the doctors had been uh, wounded or injured badly when he had uh, used this in his car in 56, he would take that out of his car and he would sell it. And the transaxle, you know, had a serial number on it, and it has been located. And there's a fella out in Los Angeles who is restoring a Porsche Spider, and he is using the original uh, drivetrain or transaxle from James Dean's Spider, and he is using that in his restoration. And last I heard, uh, he still has the car, and he's asking, of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the car, and so far he's holding on to it. Huh. 
But he, has he has he driven it yet? Uh, I'm I'm not sure about that. Okay, all right. Huh? But I'd be a little hesitant myself. <laughs> yeah, same here. I'd rather sell it and get it out of my get out of my garage. But I, yeah, huh? That that does that does this ever um, cause somebody to write the the movie Christine by chance? Yeah, it doesn't it does make you think that, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Because uh, it seems very very close. The, the strange thing is, all the stuff we've talked about is not just conjecture and hearsay and speculation and myth. Instead, this is all. Um, factual truth that can be backed up by legitimate newspapers, not things like uh, the Inquirer or the Globe or whatever, right. but actual uh, factual reporting, and it's a very strange story, uh, you know, which again makes people wonder, well, how about uh, the people that worked with James Dean on Rubble Without a Cause, his most famous picture, because a lot of strange things happened to his co-stars from that film. Okay, now, so just, just out of curiosity, you name, name a couple of things that happened out of... Okay, uh, well... In the 1960s, uh, Nick Adams, who was one of the co-stars from Rebel, right. uh, he died of a drug overdose from peraldehyde in the late 1960s. In the 1970s, Sal Mineo, that was in the film, was uh, stabbed to death in the mid-70s and killed outside of his apartment in Hollywood. Then in the 1980s, Natalie Wood mysteriously drowned off the coast of uh, Catalina. And then uh, the main love of Jimmy's whole life was a woman named Pierre Angeli that was kind of a minor B actress back in the 1950s, and that was the main love of his life. And she died of suicide before she was 40 years old. Okay, okay. So, uh, of course, that's uh, it could be related to just tragic Hollywood, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it, it, it's fascinating. It's fascinating all these different things happen. Uh, uh, as far as saying there was a curse on the on the car or whatever, I don't know, but uh, it's, it's it's just very strange, very strange. Um, now, as far as your book goes, now um, it's not in bookstores yet, so I, but it can be ordered. Right. Um, the number is to order the book. Okay, the book is nine ninety five plus a dollar ninety five postage, and it's called James Dean Beyond the Grave. And my name is Robert Reese, R E E S, and my address is two o eight o six. Park Canyon in Katy, that's K A T Y, Texas, seven seven four five zero. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. This has been very interesting. I, I, I always find this kind of thing, this kind of stuff, fascinating. I don't know why. It's odd, and especially we're in October, and we're headed towards Halloween. Halloween. And it was just the anniversary of his death last week, so the timing on this seems right too. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oscar, I enjoyed it. Thank you. And we may talk, we may, you never know. We'll talk to you again maybe about your book when it, when it gets uh, gets huge. I'd be, I'd be glad to. That'd be great. Okay. Thank Take you. care. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye-bye. College education. So what they did was they sold the best car they had because they knew they wouldn't get much for the two clunkers. Right. But they sold a really nice Honda for $4,000, and the person who bought it happened to be one of my customers. and She was real happy with the car, and they were happy to get the money. So there's plenty of good used cars out there. You just have to know what you're doing by reading a book like mine, and uh, uh, you don't have to be a mechanic. You just have to be able to read the English language. <laughs> okay, okay. So uh, now, the, like I said, you say, the first first step is checking the the, 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 the title to see if it's a... Uh, yeah, to see if it's a legitimate deal, because you don't want to go any further if it's not a legitimate deal. Okay. Uh, and if it isn't, just walk away. Now, when an average person is checking out a car, there's three main things you want to look at, and that's the body, the engine, and the transmission. Everybody can use their eyes. Look for blemishes, see if the paint doesn't match, and where you guys are, look, under advertise a car at book value, which is usually highly inflated in what it's actually worth, but they advertise it at book, so when you barter with them, you can come down. These guys already come down because they don't want to waste their time, they want to get people fast to sell cars and then sell another one, and they're, they're, they're pretty sharp at it, so you always want to look at the title, see whose name is in it. Okay. So you should well, check, the, check the name of the title and check... Look at check. the name, see if it's their name. And, uh, See how old then, the title is? Uh, of course, the biggest thing there is it'll always tell you the last owner of the car and the original owner, if they're not the original, it goes back two generations. And if uh, they say it's one owner and it's got somebody else's name on as the previous lien holder, you know, they're <laughs> giving you a line of baloney. Okay. And that makes a lot in a used car because if it's a one owner, it's worth a lot more than if it's been through two or three people. Okay, now if you're going up to these, these people and they're selling this, this used car, now, aren't they selling it for re the reason that, uh, okay, there's too many things that are going wrong with this car, so they Well, there's buy lots of reasons. A lot of people are worried that when they get a used car, they're buying somebody else's problem. Yeah. Now, some of the times that's the case, but that's why I wrote this book. Today, it's not as much as it used to be because with the price of new cars averaging over $20,000, a lot of people can't afford a new car, and a lot of people, when they need cash, you just think, the only way you can get ready cash is by selling a car if you've got a nice car. It might take you a year to sell a house, and you know how TVs, VCRs are. You buy
buy them for eight hundred dollars. If you ever try to sell them or pawn them, you're going to get about fifty dollars. Right, so right. Cars are worth a lot of money. And uh, as an example, last year I had a customer. She had three cars. Her and her two sons had three cars, and they needed money for field things. Okay, now if if I was going out to get to, if I see a car I like, and I say see it, then it's uh, now would you recommend buying from a a car dealer or buying from? Uh, well, most people like buying from an individual because right. buying from an individual, they feel like uh, they're going to get a, a more honest deal. Now, there's one thing people have to watch for. It's got a name now. It's called curbsiding. There are a lot of people out there that are selling used cars, adding them in papers, and they're pretending it's their car or their brother-in-law's car, right. and they're salesmen, really. Right. Uh, you want to check that out by always looking at the title of a car before any deals and if, if, if you're at all suspicious, say you want to see the title. If they say, well, they don't have it, then go on to somebody else because yeah. there's a lot of people doing that. Yeah, well, we we got a guy down, down the street here on Henry that uh, every week I go by there, he has a new car in front of his house. <laughs> yeah, now, if they're honest about it, it doesn't matter. If, yeah. if they have a used car dealer license, they can show it to you, and they'll say, yes, I'm a used car dealer, and I buy and sell. Some of those guys, they know what they're doing. They'll buy a car for 1000 sell it for 2000 mm -hmm. and if somebody gets a good car for 2000 they could be very happy with it, but a lot of these people are just guys that go out and they buy wrecked cars yeah. or cars that have been stolen. They pick them up for for five, six hundred dollars, fix them as cheaply as they can, and try to sell them for three or four thousand dollars. The general way to find those people are in the ads in the paper. The asking price will usually always be a few thousand or fifteen hundred less than what the book value of the car is in those blue books, and that's pretty much a flag that says, oh, these people. Maybe the salesman selling and pretending it's somebody else. Now, most people will.